All right, you guys. Hello, hello. Just a second. All right. I'm here. I just needed to get something from the cupboard real quick. So, hello, everybody. Welcome to another Tea Time live stream. Uh, in order to see your comments, I'll have to go to my YouTube channel to see it. So let's see, we have Tyler here, we have Armis Queen Mary says he can't make it, but hello to you anyway, because you were you were here. And Dread Production, hello. Roomba keeps trying to eat your computer charger wire, that's pretty funny. Um, anywho, so, yeah, I am here. I would have worn my, my, um what's it called, blazer, again, but I have it, well, this time I have a black blazer, but I would have worn it, but it's actually kind of a warm day here, and by warm, I mean 57 degrees Fahrenheit, which is not very warm at all, actually, come to think of it, but we, we've, we have such a cold winter, I'm used to the daytime being, you know, less than 40 degrees Fahrenheit, which is cold where I come from, so, uh, it's just kind of funny, I, I, I'm walking around the house, I'm like, geez, it's a warm day today, but it's it's still cold by <laughs> by all means. Anyway, good afternoon. Um, I'm seeing, uh, I'm going to have to refresh this because I'm seeing comments on my computer over there, but I'm not seeing those same comments on my phone. So let me see. All right, here we go. Jeffrey, how's it going? <clears throat> no, my train isn't running yet. Um, it's it still needs a lot of repairs. The whole track is is in need of some serious repairs uh, from the move up here. It was pretty move up to Portland was pretty violent for the train layout. And then when I had to move the train layout a couple days ago from the garage to this apartment, that was more violence. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and the train layout, the tracks, the bridges and stuff on the whole layout got extremely damaged. So they all need to be rebuilt. So... Alrighty. So, uh, just pre-warming the teapot and teacup. Um... But yeah, so my second channel, Alex Adner, will will show you guys the progress of trying to repair this thing and then get the trains running. I set the trains up on the track so that way the background looks nice. You know, I've had my Titanic set up there, but uh, <clears throat> but really, you know, the trains belong on this thing. So yeah. So let's see here. Um, Thank you, little gamer. Hello, Thomas. Hello, KJ McMaster. Hello, Von Doom. Hey, Sarah. Sarah says, hooray, I made it to T on tax returns with Alex. <laughs> oh, man. I, oh, I do not envy your job, Sarah. I do not. Tax returns. Oh, my gosh. <clears throat> Uh, Scanfan Ed says, hello, Alex. Hope you're doing well. Appreciate you and your content. Thank you so much. Oh, Dread Productions is Skyzilla. I see there. I see that. Okay. <clears throat> so today we're back to the, um, to the cucumber sandwiches with fresh dill. Um, I ordered like two boxes of dill, hoping that one of them was at least, you know, not rotten. Thankfully, both of them weren't. So I put extra dill in mine today. I tasted the sandwich before I laid it out. Really delicious. So I'm just really happy I don't have to deal with with the uh, dried dill anymore. That was just terrible. Never again. 
Um, and then I made a new batch of Scottish shortbread. This came out even fluffier than last time. Yeah, it's, yeah. And I, I had some fresh out of the oven. It was so good. And, um, <clears throat> but as you know, they get better as they sit. So this is the next day. We'll see how it is. But I gave my sister like half a pan full of, of these things. And she and her husband were just eating them. They just, they love them. So, uh, Tyler says, Alex, since you and I love the Queen Mary, how about we start the Queen Mary Historical Society? I think there kind of is one, isn't there? <clears throat> uh, let's see. Uh, RMS Queen Mary says, what ship was bigger, the Oceanic or the Lucania and the Campania? Uh, it was actually the Oceanic was bigger. Um, well, wait, are, if you're talking about the first Oceanic... I think Campania was bigger. Um, but if you're talking about the, the second Oceanic, the more famous one, uh, it was most certainly bigger. Okay, so the teapot is hot enough. I'm going to go ahead and dump all this out. Hello, Chris Taft. Um, for anybody new to to watching this, um, the trick to carefully maintaining old china like this is you have to pre-warm the um, the china before you put full-on boiling water in there. So when we started out the live stream, I had put. When we started off live stream, I had put hot tap water in both, emptied out half, then I added, I topped it off with boiling water. That was the intermediate temperature. Now the full boiling water is in there and I can add the tea. Today we are having Earl Grey tea. I really love the Earl Grey tea. Okay, it goes there. Five minutes on the clock, so 4.12. Did I do that right? Yeah, 412. So anyway, yeah, I'm really excited for this. Um, I'll go ahead and put this here. I don't need that right there. And the teacup goes there. Uh, let's see here. Skyzilla says, I decided what to name my ship. I made... SS Emperor and SS Predator, sister ships. While I was at it, I made another ship, the SS Fleetway. Pretty cool. Awesome. Are they, uh, well, I say they're SS, so they're, they're ocean liners, right? Uh, yeah, Tyler, um, Armis Queen Mary was talking about the Lucania, not the Lusitania. Lucania was the sister ship to the Campania. Um, Tyler says, delicious. Hope you don't mind me saying this, but the Scottish shortbread is as nice and fluffy as you are. Thank you, but... Yeah, I try to keep this ocean liner themed. Um, to... Uh, let's see. Starting to maybe consider deleting SS Predator and renaming it. All right, see you later, RMS Queen Mary. Oh, one last question. Why did the Nomadic have two propellers and not one? I, I mean, it, it has to do, I mean, you asked me a similar question a couple days ago, maybe a week ago. You asked about uh, why, there were, like one ship, I think it was Olympic or something, you asked why Olympic didn't have four propellers versus three. And my answer is still the same. They when they design ocean liners and ships or any kind of vessel really, they determine how fast they want it to go. Um, they, they determine how much horsepower they want out of it. And then from there they go on designing the engines. And then depending on how much power they can get out of the engines, they might decide to add one extra or one less. 
And so that determines how many propellers a ship has. It's not necessarily that they point at it and go, hmm, I think that looks better with two versus one. It's not usually like that. They, they usually plan it out. So if there's a, you know, so my answer is the reason why it has two as opposed to one is because they needed two. That's why. Um, KJ McMaster says, I always learn something new with your visits. Oh, thanks. Um, hello, Gaming with Kim. Uh, two more minutes on the T there. Mark Hooper says, good afternoon, Alex. Morning here in Australia. Your tea time food looks awesome. Do you have late sitting dinner later, or is this virtually a meal for you? Well, this isn't a full meal for me. This is like a, this is really more like a, like an, like a late lunch, essentially. Um, dinner, I usually prepare afterwards. So I think like, usually I'm done with this at six. It takes me two hours to eat the whole thing because I talk to you guys in between it. But at 6 p.m., I usually end the live stream. And then for about 30 to 45 minutes, I do something else. And then after that, I start preparing dinner. And so uh, it takes me like sometimes one and a half hours to make dinner. So I'm generally not eating dinner till like 8.30 p.m. sometimes, yeah, or 8 o'clock to 8.30. It's usually how long it takes me to prepare and make dinner and then eat it. So, yeah, generally speaking, after I take my final bite of this, it's about two hours and I have dinner. Um, and dinner is usually not something super heavy. I usually eat Japanese food, believe it or not. I make myself, myself some, like, Japanese food most of the time um, because it's... I don't know. I love it, I guess. But yeah. Uh, let's see. Thomas Brooks. So, oh, it's time for the tea, actually. Always burning myself on the lid. Ow. Oh, man. If I dropped this chain inside the teapot, <laughs> I don't know how I would get the tea infuser out. Alrighty. And this whole tea cup can be poured out. I'm burning my finger. Ow. Okay. Next, the sugar. One and a half. Oh, right. Stir first. Alrighty, now I am ready. Let's see here. Thomas Brooks says, Alex, when I have my china out, instead of inside the cabinet, should I keep them upside down when not in use to keep dust off? That's kind of what I do with the teacups, is I keep them, I keep the ones that I, that I use, so I only, I only use one teacup, I keep that upside down. This other teacup, I don't use it, so usually when I'm not doing tea time, I have everything nicely set up here on display. And then I keep this teacup on the top um, as part of the display. And I keep it face up because I never use it. And, the, and part of the reason why I never use it is because this one has like a big crack in it right here. Uh, the person who sold it to me... Um, 
they didn't tell me it was cracked, and they charged me the same amount of money for that teacup as they as they did for this one. And so, yeah. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I keep this one upside down to keep the dust out. But nevertheless, I mean, there's no dust. Every two days I use it, so there's no dust anyway. But um, uh, Mysterious Wanderer says they should turn the Queen Mary into apartments or condos. I think you you said something similar before about using it for homeless people or something, and my answer is still the same about that one too, which is, which is the Queen Mary is a world heritage site. You, lots of history happened there. It's extremely important to the whole world. You wouldn't just you know put condos inside you know the the Statue of Liberty or inside the you know the. Um, the Eiffel Tower, you know, you wouldn't convert, you know, historic places and, and important things like that into something like condos and apartments. It's one thing if it's, it's one thing if it's a historic hotel, but even then most historic hotels are not usually like worldwide treasured landmarks. They're usually just a historic hotel. So that's different, but the Queen Mary isn't just a, some hotel that's historic it's important to the world with its wartime duty and the people who sailed aboard the ship and the uses for the ship it would be a real shame if it was converted into condos which would never happen anyway but even even just theoretically speaking it would be a real shame if that happened so um let's see here adam m says hi alex why is it that you don't recommend working for Disney? Um, because they're unfair. Uh, your management is usually just still a bunch of kids, essentially. Um, and the pay isn't worth it. The amount of stuff you can go through while working there, you know, can be really tough and there's really no one to help you. The unions suck because the unions don't really care about helping you. They just collect your union dues and they don't help with anything. Um, and lastly, because unless you're doing like a big job there, like you've, you've got like a serious job, like as some kind of upper management, and I mean upper, upper management or executive level, or if you're an Imagineer, or if you're like a tenured maintenance worker, who's, you know, who's got years of experience, those kind of jobs can be worth it. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't be there longer than a couple of, of years. So if you're there to put yourself through college, it's okay. But I wouldn't do it for the rest of your life. There are some people I know who started working for Disney because they wanted to be there for the rest of their life. And it ruined their life working there. Ruined mine, that's for sure. I've been working years to get out of the, the rut that the Disney job put me in. Um, Damien says, did you know there was an engineer on the Disneyland Railroad? Where is that? Hold on. Who also had been an engineer on the Queen Mary in the early 60s. No, I didn't know that. Oh my god, this is so good. Wow. Last time I made these, they turned out delicious, but crunchy. And I thought, oh, well, this is fitting because the kind I bought, the Walker's brand, were crunchy. This is the exact same recipe. I just, I just did a, a different technique. Uh, and now they're fluffy, like fluffy. Like I, like I bit into it and it was soft. A totally different texture than before. And the different technique that I did this time was the recipe says use room temperature butter to cut it into the flour. And I thought, what if I used halfway to room temperature? So I take it out of the fridge for a couple minutes. I let it get a little bit warmer, but not fully room temperature. And what if I use it then? And since I did that, it turned out really fluffy. And 
Yeah, I'm doing that from now on. This is delicious. And of course we dip it in the tea, that's the whole point. Wow. It's like cake. <laughs> Holy moly. Um, everybody's asking what kind of Japanese food. Um, generally just like home cooked Japanese food. Like I don't like sit here and make sushi or, or, you know, prepare like Japanese fast food. But sometimes what I do is like one thing I make a lot is udon. So what I'll do is I'll put together like a stock made of, um, oh, what's it called? Um, it's like a fish stock that they use. Dashi. Yeah, dashi stock. So I'll make dashi stock. And then from there, I will cut up some uh, some tofu. I'll add a little bit of uh, miso paste in there because miso paste actually isn't just for miso soup. It, it can really flavor uh, a soup. So I put a bit of miso paste, a little bit of tofu, and then... I'll usually have like a hard boiled egg or something and I'll cut that in half, um, have that ready for the, for the soup. Uh, meanwhile, I have the udon boiling and I flavor the soup with soy sauce. So you, at the very end, you just, you know, drizzle some soy sauce into the soup and that darkens it and gives it a nice like flavor. And then you just throw everything together into a bowl and yeah it becomes something really good. And if I don't do a, bo a boiled egg, then what I'll do is I'll actually scramble an egg, and then as the soup is is heating in the pot, I'll just pour the, the scrambled egg in there so it'll it'll um, cook in the soup, and, uh, and then I'll serve that over the, the noodles and stuff. So udon is usually what I do. Um, I also sometimes just sear, like, like a fish or something, and I'll have that with white rice and a little bit of the seasoning called furikake and um, stuff like that. This morning for breakfast, what I actually had was I had a little bit of steamed white rice, the furikake on top, a little bit of rice vinegar to season the rice, and then over the top I cracked some eggs, and then I let that steam for a little bit, and that's kind of like a Japanese breakfast. So yeah, it's usually what I do. Um, and then occasionally I make, I'm not gonna say Thai food, but Thai inspired food. So I'll make like a, like a, like a curry, uh, like a red curry with coconut milk and stuff. And so I'll just cut up all these vegetables. And instead of putting like meat in there or whatever, what I usually put is garbanzo beans and tofu. I'm not a vegetarian, in case people are wondering. I'm, I'm not. I really am not. It's just that, uh, I don't know. Um, I'm, I've been trying to cut back on how much meat I consume all the time. So mostly what I have is occasionally I'll have beef or something. Then occasionally I'll have pork. But the most common meat I do eat when I do have meat is chicken. So little information for you. Ivan Joseph says, how much does it cost to visit the Spruce Goose? Um, we paid $20 to go into the museum. So it was $20 per ticket. And if you wanted to do the special tour like we did, where you actually got to go up into the cockpit and like see stuff really close and be able to touch things. Well, they told us not to, but, you know, we were pretty lenient on that. But if you want to do that, that's an extra, uh, extra $10. Dirt Dog, I have a video called exactly that, so just look it up. It's on my channel. Yeah, Tyler, I'm pretty sure he knows. There's some people on here who will literally type up the title of my video, like one of my videos, as a question. And 
I have a feeling that they do it because they're kind of mocking the video name. Because, I mean, who, like, how do you, like, type it up, like, word for word? But at the same time, I can't accuse them of that, because what if it's just a huge coincidence? But I do have a video of that exact title. Ivan Joseph says, favorite room to chill in the Queen Mary during a voyage. If, if the Queen Mary was sailing, I guess I... I guess the room I would choose to chill in would be the first class main lounge. But a close second would be the second class overflow lounge. The second class overflow lounge was tiny, but it was beautiful. Yeah. That's what I do. Von Doom says, Alex, were got friends with any social clubs during your Disneyland career? I used to hang with the Hitchhikers SC when I had my premium pass. I don't understand your question. Friends with social clubs. I don't I don't think I knew anybody with social clubs. Um El Nino asks, when was Queen Mary's last voyage? Tyler has it right. October 31st, 1967. She set sail on a 45... No. 41-day voyage. The longest voyage she's ever done. Not by... Not by day. Like, not by, like, 41 days, but by... By distance. Yeah. Longest voyage she ever did by distance. And uh, sailed to Long Beach under her own power. Which is funny because ships that usually sail to their final place, if it's like being a museum, usually they're towed there. But um, they had thought about towing the Queen Mary. But uh, it was too big and too crazy. That's why... It, that's why I think it's funny because some people are like, oh, they should move the Queen Mary to the UK. Um, while it is possible, it's impractical. Uh, not just because the, the ship literally can't be towed, but even if it could, it's the same problem that they had, you know, in the 1960s. They didn't want to tow it because it's so huge. Uh, it, it would just be a huge problem to try to tow a ship that big. You lose control very easily. I mean, there are cruise ships that have lost power at sea, and they try to tow them into port, and then the lines snap, you know. Uh, especially if the weather's rough, I mean. But yeah, it's because the ship is just so massive. KJ McMaster says, are your recipes available online? Um, no, I suppose not. I mean, you can find recipes for Scottish shortbread online. Um, as for the food I cook for dinner, I don't have recipes. I do it all just by, by eye. I look at it and I know what needs to go in there. And I... I don't usually measure stuff out unless I absolutely need to. So, like if I put garlic into a 
into um, like a like a sauce or something. I just kind of know how much garlic I need. I don't actually measure it out. Ivan says, was Queen Mary a real queen? It's not a dumb question. She really was. The Queen Mary, the ship, is named after um, the Queen Mary... I'm sorry. The Queen Mary, the ship, is named after Queen Mary, consort of Britain's King George V. Um... Before being married to him, she was known as Mary of Tech. So Tech is a is a uh, a place. I forget what kind of place. Is it a town? Is it a it's a region or something? Um, so yeah, she was a real person, and she was asked to name the ship after herself. So she was there when it launched, and she launched it as the Queen Mary. Um. Tyler says, Alex, I went to the Queen Mary on the 50th anniversary of her homecoming a, a, and celebrated my 30th birthday there. Uh, and my birthday was on the 5th of December. Wonderful memory. Oh, yeah, I bet. That sounds pretty cool. Uh... Dread production. I don't think I... No, I think I did. I think I saw a video on it or something. Carl, how's it going? Hi, Alex. Tell me a story of Queen Mary trip to Quebec City. Tell you a story about Queen Mary trip... Queen Mary never went to Quebec City. Not to my knowledge. Scanfan Ed, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, I love this apartment. Hello, Mateo. Oh, yeah. So, I've pretty much been putting out videos every single day this past week and a half. And, um, I'm getting exhausted. But it's absolutely necessary. Um, the views on my channel were kind of taking a dive for no reason. I haven't lost subscribers. If anything, I've gained a ton of them. But for some reason, uh, the views just dropped. People just aren't watching, and yet I get really good, uh, really good feedback from the videos I make. So I've been making more videos to compensate for the loss of views, and thankfully, the views are starting to tick up a little bit so yeah but boy it's it's not easy yeah 31 people watching You know what, I think on my phone, the chat stopped again. Oh, no, it didn't. Nobody's just talking, that's all. But anyway, so... I've been thinking about the future and, and what, uh, what videos I'll be making you know, at the end of the year and that kind of thing, and trying to plan things out ahead of time. Hello, David. Um, so I've been thinking about, because what I really want to do, and I think I've told everybody on this chat what I want to do, Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, sir, that's a good idea. Just do tax returns and watch my teas and do live streams in the background. Yeah. Um, so I've been thinking about the future and, and what I want to do. And, and no, I'm sorry, Matterhorn. The, um, the train layout is not functioning at the moment. The bridges are all destroyed and it all needs to be repaired. So there is no running of trains right, right now. Um, thank you, KJ McMaster. Um, and so in the future, what I want to do is I really want to go to different places and film. And like one of the places I want to go is I want to go to New Orleans and film footage of different historic places there. Like not like obviously I don't want to do stuff that everybody covers on their channels um, because <laughs> Well, frankly, everybody covers it. So I like to do stuff that most people haven't heard of. And Mark Cooper says, what are your thoughts on the RMS Coronia Green Goddess? Um, not much. I don't know much about the Green Goddess, to be honest. Um, oh, now people are messaging Ed says, Alex, how views continue to rise? If this is not too personal, is this a decent source of income for you? Would love to see you do really well here. You deserve it. Thank you. Um, is it a decent income? Not at the moment, but I see potential. Um, it's, you know, like I'm barely scraping by doing this as a job. Um, but... You know, I have to have help from my family and stuff to do it. But, you know, I do I do see potential in it. If I can just grow the channel more, I think it'll be fully self-sustaining. Um, Paul says, just wanted to come on and say I love your stream, man. It takes a lot of dedication and really helps a lot of people out. Thank you so much. It really does. It takes a lot of work to make my videos. I was talking to somebody last night about how about how um, it's really just not easy to do YouTube videos. I like doing it because I like I like sharing the things that I enjoy. If I had it all, if, if, if I had things my way, I wouldn't be editing videos because I, I don't like that part. I'm not much of a good editor and I don't enjoy it. I enjoy writing the scripts and talking about the history and doing research. But the part I, I, I hate the most is editing the video together. If I had it my way, I would hire someone to do that, but I don't have money for that. So I have to do it. Um, um, anyway, so... Hobgoblin says, Alex, in your opinion, did the Queen Mary have any design flaws? Yeah, she had a lot of them. Um, and they corrected them with uh, the with the Queen Elizabeth. With the Queen Elizabeth, they uh, they made the fuel consumption more efficient. With the Queen Elizabeth, they were able to remove one of the the funnels and rearrange the inside of the ship to make it more spacious. So they, so the Queen Elizabeth was actually more spacious on the inside without ever having to actually make the ship larger um, on the outside. And, um, you know, a bunch of stuff. The, the Queen Mary obviously was known for rolling. Even, you know, even if a strong breeze hit her, she would roll. So um, the Queen Elizabeth was a bit more steady, I guess I'll say. Um, so there were a few flaws with the Queen Mary. And then the Queen Elizabeth... Uh, gave more space and more room for third class than Queen Mary did. So basically, the Queen Elizabeth is the answer to all the flaws the Queen Mary had. And that's literally what they did. So they corrected a bunch of stuff. Um, Matthew asked, what was the cause of Queen Mary's rolling? She had a, a high metacentric height. 
So basically, when she was designed, she was designed to have a total of 27 double-ended scotch boilers, which are really heavy boilers, but they're also really inefficient. And as she was being built, uh, Cunard had decided to go with Yarrow boilers instead. The Yarrow boilers were a little bit more fuel efficient than the Scotch boilers. But the thing about the Yarrow boilers was even though they were larger in size, they were actually lighter in weight by a little bit. So the Yarrow boilers weighed less than the Scotch boilers, and that affected the, um, the weight distribution of the ship. So when they completed the Queen Mary, she was a little bit heavier above than they originally had calculated because she was made she was originally designed to have heavier boilers so as a result that actually raised her metacentric height and made it so she rolled more easily than they wanted so that's the reason why kj mcmaster says my dad was on the queen mary during world war ii Mark says, I'm fairly new to your channel, but I've come to look forward to your tea times. I work from home and run your, well, have your stream running whenever I can. Ocean Miners are my passion, and your company is great. Thank you so much, Mark. So, in the future, I want to, do, I want to cover other things. So I was talking about um, going to New Orleans and trying to film there. Um, I want to travel up to Seattle next time I can to film some more stuff there. Um, and then my biggest goal, my biggest ambition though, is to go with my friend, Chris, just, you know, me and him so far, going across the Atlantic to the UK. We want to do that aboard the Queen Mary 2, which is the last remaining ocean liner in service. And we want to do that and go all the way to the UK. And the reason why I want to do that isn't necessarily as a vacation. I want to do it because there's a lot of history in the UK as well as in France, or Paris more specifically, and I want to film a bunch of stuff that I can make videos out of. Like, I want to go to, I think there's something like, so far that, that I've researched, there's like 10 different places that I want to visit in the UK and Paris, and with each and by filming those locations, I can actually make several videos out of each of those locations. Um, and so, yeah. And I want to cover more ocean liners. Like, I want to do a video about SS Great Britain. I want to do a video about, you know, um, about uh, the Nomadic. You know, I want to do a video about, about uh, some places in Paris and some places in London and some places you know, in Bristol, like there's a, there's a bridge there. I keep forgetting the name, but there's a giant iron bridge there over the gorge and it's beautiful and it has an amazing history. So there's a lot of history I want to cover and I, and I can't do it at the moment because finding images for these things and getting high quality images is really difficult. And I have to make, I have to make friendships with people, you know, um, like, whenever I do a video, like, when I did my San Francisco videos, I had to make arrangements for how to use the footage. And it, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes people want you to pay for it. And so I'd rather just film the stuff myself because then I can get the angles I want. So my goal in the future is to take a transatlantic crossing aboard the, um, uh, aboard the Queen Mary 2, filming my experience on the Queen Mary 2, uh, so that way I can make videos about that and how uh, the Queen Mary 2 is still carrying on tradition and stuff like that. Like, everything that has to do with history. And my friend and I were planning on doing it in winter time of 2023. But the deal is, is that in order to do that, we have to book a, a year ahead of time. So that means by winter, of the, the coming winter of this year, uh, I'll have to have the money saved up. But as we're talking about, you know, how much it, how much work it is to run this channel, it doesn't look like the channel is producing enough money that I can actually save up for that trip. But that trip 
could mean a lot of videos. I'm thinking somewhere around 40 to 50 different videos can be made from all the footage that I want to shoot in those locations. So maybe even more because I plan to film a lot more. Like if we take a train to Paris, I plan to film the train and if, you know, if, and stuff like that. And then going to Belfast to see the Titanic Museum and stuff, filming areas around there in order to do nomadic videos and stuff. And so 50 videos is a lot of videos I can make out of all that stuff. So what I'm thinking about is actually doing like a Kickstarter. And the idea is that people who really want to support the channel, who really want to see these ideas come to life, um, they can donate to that, to the fund of helping me go across the sea. And it's actually really hard for me to talk about this because I know a lot of people are like, wait, 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 like why would we fund your vacation? But I think that it's important to mention that this isn't necessarily a vacation. While it is fun to be at these locations, I wouldn't be doing what most tourists do. I wouldn't be going to clubs and stuff. I wouldn't be seeing nightlife and whatever. It'd be literally spending there the entire time filming, researching, doing all kinds of stuff. That for me is fun. I am not a nightlife person. So, um, and so yeah. But I'm thinking about doing it that way because I was going to save up for 100% of it using this channel, but I've been working night and day on this channel to get the views up. And like I said, I, the subscriber count is going up, but the views are just stagnant. And I can't figure out what it is. I'm thinking YouTube is just not promoting my videos for some reason, like I've had issues with that before. I think that YouTube sometimes is just like, you know, it, it's an, all an algorithm. And, and one day it'll promote the stupidest thing, you know, like a dog farting, and then that'll get millions of views. But then, you know, something else that's really interesting, you know, it just doesn't get views. So when it, whenever the algorithm decides to do that to me, I have to work even harder to put out videos. And when I put out videos this quickly, I run out of content really fast, which means I have to get new content. So at this rate, I've actually put out so many videos. I put out two months worth of videos in the last week, basically. <laughs> so that was like two months worth of content I had planned. And, um, yeah, it's going fast. So I need to, to create more content. Not just ocean liners, but other kinds of interesting history. But the kinds of history I want to cover is places I have to go to. So I thought about doing that kind of thing and seeing if anybody wants to help donate towards that, doing it on Kickstarter. Essentially what it is is the offer is that I will make content, tons of it, out of these videos and the hope is that someone will help fund the creation of these videos by doing that so yeah Mark Cooper says the trip would be a terrific investment in your ventures I would love to do the Queen Mary 2 transatlantic also yeah I mean it's it's so cool and and you know and being able to cover all the history that I want to do will be really great because you know I don't want to do the same stuff everybody is doing on YouTube. I don't want to cover like the big places that everybody always do. So Yeah, I think, I think if I just stick to keep producing more and more and more content, I think the views will go up. But yeah, it's, it's hard work. I haven't, I haven't had a full day where I can just have time to myself and read a book. Like, 
one thing I really want to do is like have a day off and read the, read a book or something. And I haven't been able to do that in weeks. I, I literally spend every waking hour. I wake up, I check my emails to see if I need to respond to anybody. Then after making breakfast, I start working on videos. And I work on videos throughout the day. And then the, I think the only breaks I get is when I do these tea times and stuff or my live streams. Those are my breaks. And then, and then usually I get to working on videos afterwards. And I don't stop until you know, 10 p.m. or even midnight, and then I go to bed, and I wake up, and I do the whole same thing again, so. Scan Van Ed, yeah. I like that, too. There's a place in Bristol that has a, an old heritage steam railway. I want to film that as well and make videos about the about that that railway and other railways if I get around to where they are. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, KT. I found you because of Disney. Maybe you can make more Disney, or maybe you can even give walking tours of places. That would be a lot of editing. Actually, I... Well, first of all, I don't know about Disney, because I used to cover Disney. Um, from 2016 to 2020, for four years straight, I covered nothing but Disney content. And... I used to do vlogs and everything. A lot of the stuff had to be removed from YouTube due to copyright issues, but I used to do Disney for five years, but by 2020, the views on my channel were like zero. Nobody was watching my Disney content. And I was actually starting to panic because I almost had to just quit the channel in 2020. Like, nobody was watching anymore. There was like, there was just a few core people who continued watching, but it wasn't enough to keep the channel going. So. In 2020, I realized I had to make a big change and switch entirely. So, I basically switched to ocean liners and other history stuff. So, that's kind of what I do now. I still occasionally I'll make a video about something at Disneyland, but it will no longer be the... The Disney content will no longer be the thing because it. every time I publish a video that has to do with Disney... I get the lowest views. It doesn't even, like, there's a graph on all my videos that shows where the views should be at if the video is going to be doing well. And whenever I put videos out that are Disney, it's always at the bottom of the graph. Like, no one watches it. So, it's, you know, it's it's frustrating. Because I want people to see my, my Disney videos, you know. I used to have such a passion for Disneyland. But, yeah, I don't know what it is, but I think people just switched over to wanting to see all the big-name YouTubers do Disney. And then little people like me, they don't watch it anymore. Mateo says, if I were to go to the UK, the... Tal... 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 I can't pronounce that. Talilan? Would be my top priority for a visit. Yeah, YouTube is really crazy. It's like I was doing so well, and then, you know, 2019, 2020 hit, and the views just dropped. No one was watching my content anymore. So it was just crazy. But I had all these vlogs and all these videos I had. All of it had to be taken down due to copyright content. and um, So it was just really... That part kind of sucks. Because I've been slowly trying to re-edit those videos and publish them and stuff. And then when I do, no one watches them. <laughs> Tyler Holt says, Since Cunard and White Starline had to merge... 
to complete the Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth and operate them in the Great Depression, doesn't that mean that technically the Queen Mary is a relative to the Titanic? Yeah, basically. Um, she's a relative to the Titanic by by marriage, if you will. <laughs> so she's kind of like a, a, a step-niece to the Titanic. Skyzilla, yeah. I know what you mean. Well, what's funny is, so I have a second channel, the Alex Adner channel. It's still a new channel, so it doesn't have very many subscribers. And the funny thing is, is I forgot just how hard it was to be a new a new channel. Like, if I publish a one-hour-long video in 4K on the Alex the Historian channel, it'll upload within, like, an hour, and it'll process within 20 minutes, and it'll be in 4K and ready to view in a decent amount of time. Well, if I try to do that same thing on the Alex Abner channel, it takes, it will take the same amount of time to upload, but the processing, instead of it taking 20 minutes, the processing will take 20 hours. And so 20 hours later, people will be able to see it in 4K, which is ridiculous, but they, they prioritize giving the most processing power to the more popular YouTubers. So it's funny, like, you know, like, there were videos that, like, I want to publish day of, but they're in 4K, and it won't finish processing for hours. So it's just like, oh my gosh. Yeah, it's funny that... Oh, yeah, I know you're subscribed subscribe to it. It's funny that the Queen Mary actually played the Titanic a few times. She played the Titanic in SOS Titanic and then in Titanic 2. I'm like, the Queen Mary and Titanic look nothing alike, but the funny thing is, is I think that most people don't know that, you know? I think that... Because I've heard people look at the Queen Mary and they go, oh, it's, it's uh, you know, it's like the Titanic. It looks, you know, and I'm like, it looks nothing like Titanic. But to some people, they look at it and it looks identical. Hello, Lori. The fresh dill makes all the difference. This is so good. That dried dill was terrible. Tastes nothing like the dried dill tastes nothing like fresh dill. It's weird. It's like night and day. Well, thank you, Scanfan Ed. Keep your head up, Alex. You're doing great, and it will build. Is there a way to contribute to you without YouTube taking such a large chunk? I have a Patreon, and then... If you don't like Patreon either, I have Venmo. So I, there's some people who, they Venmo me whenever they feel like it. Like, they don't have to subscribe to, like, you know, monthly or whatever. Like, there's one person who I think Venmos me every two months or something. Just, like, five bucks or something. But, but yeah, so um, I have that. And the links are in the description of this video. So you'll see some, you'll see, like, my Patreon, my... YouTube membership, my, um, oh, I also have Square, so you can go to Square and then, like, uh, and then put in a donation on Square, so Venmo, Square, Patreon, and YouTube. Yeah, I'm hoping the my goal for this year is to, like, I want to do stuff where I make art or something that I can sell. Like, 
I thought about how lots of people collect like paper items of artwork. So like especially ocean liner people, they love paintings, they love postcards, they love bookmarks. And I thought, why don't I do that? Why don't I draw some pictures or paint some pictures, whichever I'm better at. Because I, I, I do know how to paint, I do know how to draw. I've never painted or drawn an ocean liner before in my life. So I'm interested to see if I'm actually good at it. Um, normally I do landscapes. That's usually what I do. Like I'm good at drawing and painting landscapes. Um, but I'm completely new at, at buildings and ocean liners and structures and stuff like that. So, but I am thinking about drawing and painting ocean liners and trains and seeing if people would buy those, you know? So if they buy them as bookmarks or as postcards or as printed out pictures, then I'm thinking maybe I can do that. And then maybe that's where I'll get the money to go to the UK. Yeah. Then of course the second channel I'm hoping will become super popular too. And then with the Alex Historian channel putting out all kinds of content that I'm hoping will reach a wider audience. Like uh, I'm hoping tomorrow I'll publish a another like little opinion piece video uh, about what it's like to be on ocean liners in rough seas. Um, and then Friday I'm hoping to have a history video about the Benson Hotel. It's a very beautiful hotel. I think it has an interesting little history to it. So I want to cover more than just ocean liners. Of course, there'll be a huge focus on ocean liners. It's my favorite thing, but, um, but yeah, I want to do just more than just ocean liners. So, and then of course, um, after I do the Benson Hotel thing, there's probably going to be a few more opinion piece videos about ocean liners, and then I want to do a full history video about the um, the H4 Hercules, or the Spruce Goose, as people know it. So I'm thinking there will be, I'm thinking the content hopefully will be really popular and a lot of people will watch it. That's my goal. Oh, Tyler, thanks. Yeah, there's a lot of really cool stuff on the YouTube membership. Um, and then, uh, and then, like, if you, if you join the Archivist tier on either my Patreon or my YouTube, you also get access to my Discord server, where you can, like, have a conversation with me. What's funny is I have, like, several archivists signed up, but only, like, four of them are on my Discord server. So I'm talking to the same four people all the time. <laughs> and I'm like, this is great, but I wish there was more people here so we can have a party, you know? Like, there's a bunch of stuff I want to do. Like, I want to do live streams where I can show really cool things that I that um, that I have access to and stuff like that. And then share, share information with people who I, I can't normally share directly online, like... Right now, I'm actually involved in a really cool project that um, <laughs> I think people would think it's really cool as well, but I can't talk about it yet because it's still in the early works, and so the people I'm working with probably wouldn't want me to talk about it just yet, but I know I can on my Discord server because there's only a few people on there, so... Carl says, in your Queen at War, there's something of the Queen somewhere in Quebec province. Are you talking about... Uh, there's something of the Queen somewhere in Quebec province. I know I talked about how the ships went to Halifax, Nova Scotia, but I don't know about Quebec. I 
I don't recall. Yeah, I don't recall talking about Quebec. <laughs> Sarah says after tax season, Discord server. Okay. Foolish Immortal says, hello, Alex, just rode the caboose at Disneyland. Oh, wow, they have the, um, the, the freight train out, finally. That thing's been gone for a long time. Like, a long time. It's good to hear that it's back. I was actually worried that it was gone forever, just like the E.P. Ripley. You know what's weird? In the first hour of this live stream, I actually finished the food. Usually I don't, like, finish till, like, an hour and a half in. But I am going to top off the tea. Yeah, I like doing these tea times because it allows me to be able to just talk to people and have fun. That's a muddy brown color I don't like. Oh, jeez. Spilled sugar on myself trying to... Let's see who's in the chat. Foolish Mortal says, yeah, they returned it last Tuesday. Holiday 5 is now in its place, and sadly, so is Lily Bell. Oh, jeez. Yeah, they need to give the Disneyland Railroad more of a budget. It just doesn't have enough. It, the EP Ripley is my favorite engine there. And they don't even take care of it. It's like, they say, oh, it's it's under refurbishment. But we all know it's hidden underneath a tarp somewhere in some warehouse. Like, they're not even working on it. So, it's just really sad. Mysterious Wanderer says, do you know of ocean liners that served the Pacific? There was the Hikawa, Hikawa Maru. Um... There are smaller ocean liners I know about that they're not like what we think. Like we don't like they're not like big like the Queen Mary, but there are ocean liners. Like I I, did, I covered the um, the SS Princess Louise, and then I plan to make a video about the SS Princess May, and a few other princess ships. I don't want to cover Catalina Island ships. Those aren't ocean liners necessarily, but the but I think the reason why is because I just I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Catalina Island ships, I just don't. Um, Japanese ocean liners, we'll see if I ever get there, but frankly, I have so much more to cover before I even ever get to Pacific ships. Uh, at least not South Pacific. Um, there's even another ship that I'm, I, I'm eventually going to be working on a video for, is the Johan Olden... The Johann von Olden Barnevelt, which was a Holland Line ship. Um, that's another one I'm currently researching. Oh, so, yeah. Lots of ships in the works. Tyler Frederick asks Lily Bell. The Lily Bell is a. Um, a private car that is located at the end of one of the trains on the Disneyland Railroad. It is um, a passenger private car, and it has been made extra fancy for VIPs and, uh, and heads of state to be able to travel on board. Um, the Lily Bell is a treasure of the Disneyland Railroad, um, uh, but as I hear now, it's it's... It's backstage. Hmm. 
So yeah. Um, gosh, where is? I usually have so much more to talk about on these live streams. This one's feeling kind of slow today. Um, but yeah, so I brought all my model making supplies up here. So I have like all my stuff that I use to build models. I'm still trying to figure out a way that I could get more ocean liner models when I have money. <laughs> Because um, I want to build those and make videos about them uh, for the Alex Adner channel. Um, yeah. And then, of course, work on the, tr the train layout as well. So my goal is to really build that channel, but... Sarah Paul says, I know this is strange, but I hope they stop the railroad again for a bit so I can walk across the tracks at New Orleans Square Station to the old Frontierland one. That was cool. That was a really cool experience. I remember when that happened. Um, I It was like a dream come true for me because I'd never been over there. So being able to cross over the tracks and see the old Frontierland Depot on the other side, and I got to touch it. I just walked up to it and just touched the railing. I was like, oh my gosh, this is like... No one gets to do this unless you're like a railroad cast member and even then they're not as big of nerds as you know i am and so yeah that was a really cool experience to be able to see the train from the other side of the tracks that's also weird too especially if you're looking at the freight train because from from the side of the from the the side where you load onto the train that the freight train doesn't look any different than the rest of the Disneyland railroad it looks the same but if you're on the other side of the freight train, you can see a stark difference. You can see that there's actually box cars and gondola gondola cars and a caboose. Like it looks like a freight train from the other side. So it's just funny because, you know, like that's not a sight you get to see unless you're at, you know, at least you're at, at not when you're until you're at the um, the main entrance of Disneyland looking at it. But most people don't even pay attention anyway, so they don't see it, but... Uh. <laughs> Mark Cooper says, No, Alex, it is relaxed, not slow. Sometimes we need to be human beings and not human doings. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> I like that. Uh. Matthew says, I think the Queen Mary should have stayed in England. At times, I think that too, but you know, I mean, obviously, there, obviously, no, nobody in England was going to save the ship. Everybody in the UK was the only people who were auctioning, uh, I'm sorry, bidding for it, were scrappers. So, the United States and other countries were the only countries who were willing to actually preserve the ship. Um, but yeah, I do think if at the time, if there was an organization that was willing to save the Queen Mary back then, I do believe she would be in much better shape today if she was in the UK, had that happened. But it didn't, so it didn't, and here it is. <laughs> uh, oh, gosh. Skyzilla says, I just finished the drawings of SS Fleetway and SS Emperor, and I've come to the conclusion of deleting SS Predator. Okay. For now, she may come back in the future. Nice. Yeah, you know, what really bugs me is I can't get models of a bunch, like, there's a bunch of ocean liners I want models of that I can build, and nobody makes them in the same scale you know what i mean like it's weird that i can't find models of the queen mary and titanic new models i should say in the same scale well frankly there are no new models of the queen mary i think the 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 last time they ever produced a model of the queen mary was in like 1986 
which doesn't make any sense to me. It's like, it's a really popular ship. Why hasn't anybody made a new model of it? So, it's annoying, but... I have to check on Titanic Honor and Glory's website because at one point they were they were creating a, a, a uh, model of the Queen Mary that they could sell. And I was so stoked for it. I was like, if they sell this model, I am buying it. And then they said, oh, we're going to slow down on our model production because we have to catch up. And I'm like, darn it. Like, I really want that model of the Queen Mary. I know they have one. They were testing it. They were printing out like four or six of them at the same time. I'm going to contact them. I'm going to see if they'll sell me one of those. Because I, re <laughs> I really want a model of the Queen Mary. I'm, I, when I make my videos, oh, jeez, people are just arguing Oh, God. I don't like listening to that. People just yelling and screaming. Jeez. Anyway, um... It's a little... Little kid throwing a tantrum. Um, so... So, I, I want... I can't think with her screaming. I can't... I don't know why. I can't think. Uh... Glenn says, I've been watching but unable to chat, but here I am. Okay, cool. Well, I'm glad you're still here. Um... Yeah, you know, Robert, I think the QE2 really should have stayed in the UK. Um, it's really a, it's really disappointing to know that that the big ocean liners from the 1900s, none of them are in the UK. You know, the only remaining ones left that are British built is the Queen Mary and the QE2, and neither of them are in the UK. That is very disappointing. Um... Uh, Mark says, I have models of the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth from Airfix. I have had them for like 20 years, and they are still in the wrapper. You haven't built them? Oh my gosh. Glenn says, in the UK, we seem to sell off our jewels. Yeah, I'd say <laughs> the UK tends to sell them off and in the United States, they tend to just burn everything down. They just... In the United States, we hardly keep anything old. It's really annoying because there's a, there's, a, there's a kind of thinking in the United States that when something uses its... When something loses its utility purpose, then nobody cares for it anymore. Um, so it's really sad because, you know, the UK has a lot of heritage railways. They have a lot of old ships and things like that. Maybe not big ocean liners like the Queen Mary, but they have other ships and things. There is a sense that the UK cares about its history, even though they tend to sell a lot of it off. But the thing about the US is, like, as soon as, like, something is no longer used for what it was built for, we just get rid of it. We just... We, we scrap it. And it's really sad because, you know, like, there aren't very many historic things to see in most cities in the U.S. Even Portland, a lot of the buildings here are really old, but there's no museums of these old things. I think the, I think the only museum I found was Pittock Mansion. And Pittock Mansion, it ha it's interesting, but that's it. That's, that's all there is. Despite having all these old buildings, none of them are technically museums. And, and you know, so it's just really sad. Like, there isn't much of anything here. And then uh, when my friend was visiting, we went to Union Station in Portland. And it, it looks Victorian. You look at the station, you're like, that looks like a Victorian building. And my friend was like, ah, it can't be Victorian. It can't be Victorian. We walk inside and... 
where, and he's looking at stuff on his phone to see when it was built. It was built in like the 1880s. So it is a Victorian uh, building. And then the interiors were refreshed in the 1920s. So it hasn't, so the inside of the station is all Art Deco looking. But nobody cares about the station. So even though it's this big, beautiful Victorian building with an Art Deco interior, like, there's no signs or anything saying, this is our beautiful train station. Like, there's no pride in it, you know? Like, there's no pride in it at all. And I'm like, where is the pride? This is a beautiful building that should be advertised. People, people should be taking tours of it. And they don't have any of that. It's just, oh, it's just some old building that we haven't knocked down yet. And it's so sad to see stuff treated like that, you know? It's just so sad. And... There's a lot of really old buildings in Chinatown in Portland, like really old. Like some of these buildings are built in the 1880s. You can totally tell. But they're abandoned and empty and run down. And I'm sure there's tons of history behind those buildings. I'm sure like there must have been stories of, you know, gunfights and things happening in, in those old saloons and stuff. And But I doubt anybody has ever written it down or or put it anywhere, you know, like... There's these things called Shanghai Tunnels in Portland. They're, they were famous. The Shanghai Tunnels were tunnels that interconnected underneath Chinatown. And, um, and what it was was that, is that uh, people who would go to the saloons and stuff, like men in the, in the 1880s, 1890s, 19, early 1900s, they would go to the saloons and drink until they got drunk. And then what would happen is... Like, it didn't even matter, like, what race they were. Like, most of them were white. They got kidnapped, taken down into the tunnels, where they were then put onto, like, ships and sent away to different places to be used as, like, uh, as, like, um, what do you call it? Like, uh, essentially slave labor, because they weren't, you know, some of them weren't even paid for their jobs. Well, I'd say some, but most of them weren't paid for their jobs. They, they essentially were, like, owned by these companies, and they were taken so far away from their homes without any way of getting back. And so that's why they called them the Shanghai Tunnels, because you got Shanghai out of there. And so there's, like, all this old history in Portland, and there's, like, no way to explore that history. I think the closest thing we found was there was, like, a walking tour of Portland that they were selling for, like, 30 bucks. I was like, I'm not paying 30 bucks to hear a bunch of ghost stories. Like, I want to see history. I want to walk through history. I know, like, one of, one of the stops on the ghost tours was the Benson Hotel. And I told my friend, I said, look, I, I said that tour, they don't even go inside the hotel. They just stop outside of it and look at it. I'm like... I'm like, I'd rather just save the money and walk into the hotel myself and ask if I can explore, and they let me do it. We walked in there, and I was like, hey, I was like, can we, you know, explore the lobby and just film it and stuff? And and the people at the Benson Hotel were like, oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. And we just did. We walked around the whole lobby area. It's a huge two-story lobby with, like, a mezzanine and all that, like, beautiful, beautiful old Edwardian structure with lots of of wood paneling that most of it is from trees that no longer exist um and so we just did that and you know but it's 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 astounding how very little history is documented you know in in the united states and how spread out it is because of that so Rant over. Um, hello, Gaming with Ken. I'm doing okay. Mysterious Wander says, Did children throw tantrums like that at Disneyland a lot? Oh, yeah, of course. There's a lot of children at Disneyland. They get tired, they get hungry, they throw tantrums. I never liked it. <laughs> it was... I. It was really difficult to keep a poker face whenever I had to be near a child who was screaming their lungs out, having a tantrum. I, it's, no one wants to be around that, obviously, so it's not like, you know. But 
and you just have to stand there and just pretend like it's not happening because if you make like a face like you know you can get in trouble for that so um Mysterious Wanderer says, did you ever visit the Mission Inn? The Mission Inn? I've, I haven't heard of that. Is that in Portland? Skyzilla says, kidnapped. Yeah, the people with the, the guys would get drunk in the saloons, then they get kidnapped, and then they would get sold, basically, as slave labor. And they would have to work on ships and other various places. They, they would get, like, I think the way it worked was was they would get kidnapped, but they could buy their freedom. And the thing is that their freedom usually costed a lot of money. And so they would work for years and years and years, you know, in horrible conditions with horrible, you know, like, you know, horrible food and all that, work in these horrible conditions, and they'd have to slowly work towards paying off, you know, the, the debt of what they're of what they were worth of course it was very illegal to do that um, and eventually that did come to a stop but yeah it yeah Mateo says Portland's only proper museum is the ORHC oh yeah the Oregon uh, Railroad Heritage Center yeah Glenn says, in the UK, we have blue plaques to celebrate historic buildings, and also we have listed building licenses and history acts. We have something similar, like, um, there's, like, different lists. There's, like, list of national historic places, then list of national historic landmarks. If something gets a... Oh, and there's also a list of national monuments. And it's a tiered system. So if it's a historic place, it's just got the title of being a national historic place. National Historic Landmark is able to apply for grants and stuff like that um, for their upkeep. But then National Monument is, um, is a place that is owned and operated by the United States government. And monuments can be um, can be parks, can be buildings, can be boats. So, yeah. So um, we have stuff like that, and we do like the Queen Mary is considered a national historic landmark, which means that they could use that status to apply for grants that would help with her restoration. Uh, but uh, the city wants to turn it into a national historic monument, which requires an act of Congress to make it happen. Um, but then that would mean the United States government would be in charge of the Queen Mary. I think once the United States does, if the United States was in charge of the Queen Mary as a national historic monument, I don't think it would operate as a hotel anymore. It would just be a walk-up tourist attraction that you could walk around in. But yeah, so there's like there's things like that, but it doesn't really help that much. Uh, let's see. Linda says, "Hello, Alex. Happy tea time. I just made a cuppa, and I'm joining you." Oh, thanks. I still have some tea here. I ate everything I had, but. The Scottish shortbread I made was so, so good. Oh, my God. Much better than the first time I made it. Sarah says, I have no idea if you have been there, but I would love to know your opinion as a chef of Voodoo Donuts. I always thought they weren't that great, just nicely decorated. My thoughts exactly, Sarah. I went there when we first came to live in Portland, Everyone was like, oh, you got to go to Voodoo Donuts. And I was like, okay, it's one of those things that if you're in Portland, you have to do it. So I did. And I did not like it at all. Um, I had all kinds of donuts. I think, I think me and my dad, we, were, we wanted to try all kinds of them. So we bought like 
a box of like 12 or something like that and each one was like a different donut um very expensive between the two of us but yeah um and i was like okay i know one or two of these i might not like but the rest look really delicious but i was trying them and each one i did not like the flavor it looked all of them looked amazing they looked delicious but the flavor was oftentimes sickly sweet uh which for those people who don't know <laughs> is where something is so sweet it makes you nauseous um so there was like that and then what's funny was a lot of these donuts that they have they cover in chocolate right and the and the chocolate is what holds the various decorations and stuff on the donut but the thing was the chocolate they were using tasted terrible like it tasted like 7-Eleven chocolate donuts. No, no, never mind. 7-Eleven chocolate donuts taste better than that. <laughs> um, the chocolate was just terrible. It tasted like some kind of, like, factory-produced, like, like, lasts-forever kind of chocolate. Like, not, like, good chocolate. I can't, I can't describe the taste. It was bitter, and it was brownish, like... No, I'm not doing a good job at describing it. It tasted disgusting. Let me just tell you that much. I've had chocolate. I used to, in culinary school, we I had a I had a class that was entirely based on chocolates. We tried chocolates from all over the world, and we learned how to how to make different kinds of like chocolate ganaches and candies and everything. Like, I have a lot of experience with chocolate, and this chocolate was disgusting. And I remember just eating it and going, ugh, like how could anyone like that? That chocolate was so gross. Ugh, horrible experience. I think we ended up just throwing away most of the donuts. Like a lot was a lot of money down the drain because they looked so good. We were just, we thought we were going to love it. We, they looked so delicious. We, we just, we, we, we assumed we would love it and it just tasted so terrible. And it was funny because when my friend Chris was visiting, we, we were in an Uber, and the Uber driver was like, hey, have you guys had Voodoo Donuts? And and he's like, what do you think? And tell me the truth. And I was like, okay, I'll tell you the truth. I like, I hated it. And the guy immediately was like, really? And he was like, I, I love that place. And I was like, oh, uh-oh. <laughs> he was expecting for, for us to say that we liked it. But, well, he, I don't think, well, did Chris have, I don't know if Chris had Voodoo Donuts, but I did, and they, I just hated them. Worst donuts I've ever had in my life. We have better donuts in Southern California. And I, I, I'm embarrassed to say that because Southern California has terrible donuts. But I've had much better donuts there. Um, Sarah says, I thought Portland had OMSI, like a zoo and science place or something. Yeah, the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry. Uh, we, we almost went in it's it's like a little discovery center for children to be honest it's not like a like okay to be fair we didn't walk around the museum we went inside of it to get tickets for the submarine which is sitting outside the museum and we missed our chance to get on the submarine that was actually my fault because i was doing a live stream that morning i don't know if you guys remember this but i was doing a live stream that morning and I and Chris was like, we gotta get going, we gotta get going. I'm like, we have plenty of time. And what ended up happening was we didn't have plenty of time, and we got there really late, and we missed our chance to see the submarine. Um, but uh, yeah, so. Uh, but the museum looked very much like a like a children's science center. It didn't look like the kind of place that adults would would normally go by themselves. Um, so they have that. And by all means, you know, we need to get kids interested in science, so I, that's great, but it's not, a, not the kind of place I think I would go. Um, let's see. Let's see. 
Linda says, yes, I'm not much of a fan of voodoo donuts either, but I'm not much of a fan of donuts in general. Yeah, that's true. A lot of donuts can be pretty gross, but... I think my favorite donuts are beignets, and I make those fresh, you know. Um, when I had a cafe, I used to actually sell those. Those were the number one selling thing at the cafe. Wasn't even the lunch food, wasn't even the breakfast food, it was the beignets. Everybody ordered beignets. I remember we had to make so much beignet dough every morning. It was way more than we expected. Um, I think it was twice as much as we originally had anticipated. We had to make twice as much beignet dough every day than we had originally inspect, uh, uh, expected. And it made me, made me upset because I wanted to get a deep fryer specifically for the beignets, but because we had calculated we wouldn't be making very many, we didn't buy the deep fryer, instead bought some little countertop deep fryer. And I was like, I should have bought the full one because that's the full one is uh, how you make a lot of beignets all at once. Um, oh, Sarah's got to leave. All right, I'll see you later. As Karthik says, what is Voodoo Donuts? So Voodoo Donuts is just basically a popular donut place here in Portland. It's become nationwide famous for its... I, I don't know why, but people think it's delicious. Um, and the, and the, the donuts look really creative, so I, I will give it that. The donuts look really nice. Um, and they've become, yeah, nationwide famous, but, uh, but I don't like them. <laughs> I don't like the way they taste. Um, like, I don't understand why they couldn't have used regular chocolate, you know, like... Yeah, I don't... They they used something. It tasted like death. <laughs> the chocolate tasted like death. It was so bad. I was just like, ugh. But, um... Um... Skyzilla says, but what I'm thinking is it... It just made it just could be Portland's voodoo donuts because voodoo is the other um yeah but there there's there's only two voodoo donut places in the in the whole world um well at least I guess two two of this company this company has only two locations and they're both in Portland so it's they're not like they're not a chain they're 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 like a small like a small business, and they have two locations in Portland, but that's it. They don't have Voodoo Donuts everywhere else. It's it's not a chain, so there's no reason why their there's no reason why their their donuts should be so bad, you know. Because if they were a chain, that might that might make sense. Because because sometimes what happens is uh, one store in that chain might do things incorrectly and it's really bad but when you have only two stores the people who started the company have direct oversight of just these two little locations so it shouldn't it, it's not a mistake it's just how their donuts taste so that's the problem with it um uh Linda Solis says, oh yes, beignets are great. They had some good ones at the French Quarter in Walt Disney World. The, um, the hotel, the, um, the French, what do you call it? The French, I forget what it's called. Yeah, I know that hotel has, um, has beignets, so yeah. I, I've never, I've never had those, so I wonder if those are good, but I know that the beignets they have at Disneyland are terrible. <laughs> But it's funny because people like them. Uh, but I think it's because people who have the ones at Disneyland have never had beignets anywhere else. So I don't think they have anything to compare it to. But I've had beignets from several different places in my life. And then, of course, my favorite beignets are the ones I make. But I'm not that I'm bragging. But, um, but yeah, so I the ones at Disneyland, though, if you've had other beignets, the ones at Disneyland are terrible. Mm -mm. Um...
Linda Solis says, a chat or two ago, you mentioned taking an ocean liner cruise in current times, maybe QE2, or is there a Queen Mary 2? It is Queen Mary 2, yeah. Um, I was actually talking also about that a little bit earlier in this live stream, too, was I, I want, me and my friend Chris, uh, we want to go on the Queen Mary 2 to a trip to the UK and to Paris and also to to quickly visit Belfast. So we have this whole idea in mind, what we want to do, and I, I want to use that trip to film tons of footage of historic places so that way I can make videos on it, like at least 50 different videos. Um, but yeah, I, I'm having trouble saving up for that because uh, the, the money I'm making from YouTube, for some reason, the, the channel isn't growing as quickly as I originally thought it would. But... Um, I'm thinking about creating like a like a Kickstarter to see if anybody wants to donate towards that just so they can see those videos a lot sooner because at this rate, it'll probably take me three years to save up for that trip. But if I can go do that trip sooner, those videos can come out much quicker. Um, but yeah, so I do have plans to do that um, aboard the Queen Mary 2. It's funny because my friend Chris, like, he's ready to go. Like, I think if I said, hey, let's go at the end of the year, he'd be ready to do it, but... Uh, but I'm not yet. I have to save up money for myself. So, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know. It's it's it, it it's going to be super exciting. And I have a fear of, <laughs> I have a fear of the ocean. So it's going to be interesting to see how I handle being on that ship. Um, but it is a massive ship, so I think I would feel a little bit more at ease. Uh, rather than taking something small. Not that there is anything that I could take across the Atlantic. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that would be a really cool trip. I'm actually really excited to do that. I really, really want to see all these historic places and learn new information and bring all that stuff to you guys, because that's what makes me happy. I mean, this YouTube channel doesn't earn me very much money, but I think mostly I just enjoy making the content. I enjoy being able to share all this, like, stuff that most people don't know about, you know, like, because I don't usually cover the big things. I don't usually cover, like, I don't know. Like, I don't think I would make any Titanic videos about, like, the history of Titanic, because everybody covers that already. I want to do the history of, like, ships that people don't really talk about. So while everybody's like, Alex, you got to do a history video, you know, on the QE... No, 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 that's a bad example. Of, I don't know. I don't know. But, uh, yeah. So there's stuff I want to cover. I want to make history videos about stuff. And that's kind of one of my things. Um, S. Karthik says, I noticed a few days ago that the cruise speed of Queen Mary is equal to the average speed of many trains here. Interesting. Skyzilla says, you have a fear of the ocean. Wow, sometimes when I'm in a car ride, I'll go, I'll get butterflies in my stomach and feel like throwing up, so I'm not sure if I would handle well on a ship. Yeah, I, I have a fear of being on the ocean. But, uh, but I think what helps is being on a giant ship like that. It makes me feel a little bit better. Um, I think what scares me the most is that there's, like, thousands of feet of just nothing but water under underneath. That's what scares me. I like being on solid ground. Um, funny thing is, is like I'm not afraid of flying. I just don't like to fly because it's so inconvenient to me. Like I, I hate the experience of being in a plane. It annoys the crap out of me. So I don't have a fear of flying, but I do avoid flying as if I have a fear of it. Um, but it's funny, if I want to take a trip on the Queen Mary 2, I have to fly from Portland to New York to catch it. So, that's going to be interesting. Um, what was I saying, though? I, was, I feel like I was going to talk about... Oh, yes, the Queen Mary. So, I learned a new detail last night, and a lot of people are not going to believe it. So, everybody knows that the fastest recorded speed of the Queen Mary was 32.84 knots, right? Fastest uh, 
recorded speed that, that most people know about. Well, last night I was talking to a, a friend of mine who, I would, I would call them a historian, just because they, they know so much about the ship, and they have access to information that most people don't have. So I was talking to him last night, and he was saying, oh, yeah, you know, the, the Queen Mary could do 38 knots. And I was like, wait, 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 wait. I was like, no, that's that's a mistake. The Queen Mary never went faster than 32.84 knots. You know, it's well documented. He goes, well, actually, it's also well documented that during World War II, she often exceeded 38 knots. And this got me really intrigued. I wanted to know more. And it's really interesting. Um, so... Uh, there is documentation that the Queen Mary did go past 38 knots, and I've actually requested to see if he can get me copies of that documentation because I want to be able to show it to people when I tell them, um, except for now, because obviously I don't have it yet. But um, but basically what would happen is during World War II, if the ship was going to pass through a particularly dangerous area and they needed to get through it very quickly, what the captain would do is he was he would order all the the safety valves um, in the boiler rooms to be disengaged. And then he would order the boiler pressure to be cranked up well over um, the normal operating pressure of the boilers. And so with that, the engines would go even faster. And the ship, God only knows how many horsepower it was putting out. Um, like, seriously, like I, I don't even know how much that would calculate to. Maybe it's in the log books because they're going to send me copies of the logs. So maybe the horsepower is documented in the log books. But the ship would go over 38 knots just to sprint through these areas of dangerous waters. And, um, and there is documentation of like one, uh, one person who was there as an engineer during World War II said that... Um, so that he would look at the fuel tanks of the ship and he could visibly see the fuel literally dropping as the ship consumed so much fuel as it raced through the water at 38 knots. Unbelievable. So Tyler says, if that's true, that means the Queen Mary could have got, gotten the blue ribbon back from the United States. Yes, you're right. If this is true... And I, I'll find out as soon as I get the documentation of it, and I'll make a video about it too, so I can show everybody the documentation. But if it's true, yeah, if the Queen Mary would disengage her safety valves and go over the um, the designated boiler pressure, and she could go faster than 38 knots, as they said, she could have competed and got the blue ribbon back from the United States. I mean, obviously, this this never. This never actually happened. She never actually did. And the reason why is because bypassing the safety valves is a major issue. If the boiler explodes, you know, the company's liable for doing something so dangerous. But, um, but during the war, war is war. You know, if there's 15,000 troops aboard the ship, they can't let the ship get torpedoed. And it's funny because this also makes sense because... After I published my three-part video series about the Queen Mary during World War II, I had one or two people say, oh, my grandfather sailed aboard the Queen Mary during the war, and and they said that, you know, like, I think one person said, oh, my, my grandfather got across the ocean in under three days. And someone else said the same thing, too, basically, like, under three days. And I was like, oh, no, that's not possible. I think the fastest the Queen Mary ever uh, got across the ocean, I think was like three days and 16 hours or something like that. So under three days isn't possible, but yeah, I think during the war that would have been possible if they ran the ship at well over 38 knots to get through the, the, um, submarine infested waters, they could get across the ocean much faster. And maybe that's why these people say their grandfathers said it took under three days to get there. Unbelievably fascinating. Uh, 
Chris of the cases, I told the guy in the cab that I didn't like Voodoo Donuts. That's why the ride was so awkward. We have one of them in California. We what? Really? There's a Voodoo Donuts in California? Well, anyway, I had Voodoo Donuts when I first came here. I took a picture with them, but yeah, I hated those. Terrible. Uh, let's see. S. Karthik says, one question was always in my mind is that the Poseidon... Mind is that, is the Poseidon bigger than Titanic and Queen Mary? It looks as big as Queen Mary too. I mean, I guess that depends because there was two different movies. There was a 1974 movie and then a 2006 movie, I think. But I don't know. It's, it's fictional, so I don't know. I don't cover the fictional stuff. Um... Robert says, holy crap, 38 knots is insane. If that's true, if she had trouble with vibrations just cruising, going 38 knots would be interesting. Yeah, but um, but the Queen Mary's vibration issues were solved in 1938, so by the, by the wartime, she wouldn't have had such vibration issues. But that being said, whatever vibrations she did have would have definitely been amplified at 38 knots, that's for sure. Um... Tyler Holt says, oh wait, no, there's someone else. Sir Shitbiller says, imagine being on a FaceTime call for a whole five hours with your bestie. It totally wasn't me. Did I miss something? Looks, sounds, sounds like, like the middle of the conversation or something. But um, Tyler Holt says, wait, so the Queen Mary was able to go faster than the United States? I mean, if this is true, if, if I get the documentation and it does indeed say 38 knots or more, because um, my friend said it could be more, that uh, it could have been like 39, 40 knots um, at certain times, um, then yeah, the Queen Mary could. But it's important to say that this is if the safety features were switched off. So this wouldn't be safe. Um, it wouldn't be safe for the Queen Mary to do it. So it's not like it was just like, oh, yeah, let's just crank up the speed. It's more like uh, let's turn off all the safety features and get the ship going. Um, but, yeah, so if it's true, then that it would mean that the Queen Mary could reach more than 38 knots and could have recaptured the Blue Ribbon if they had absolutely no uh, care at all for the safety of passengers. <laughs> um Tyler says three days, twenty hours, and twenty minutes was her fastest time. Okay, that's it. Then, and then the and then the um, the SS of the United States was three days, ten hours, or three days, eleven hours, something like that, right? So yeah, so yeah, that's crazy. Linda Solis says, "Oh wait, that's Psycho Donuts." <laughs> Chris with the cases, I thought the SS United States had a top speed of 42. No. Um, so they had a top speed of 44, they say, but they but it's believed that it's top, if I can have this correctly, that 44 was its, was its highest achievable speed, but it never actually reached that speed. It was like supposedly the 44 knots was the secret speed of the SS United States. Um, but 38 was its fastest speed, according to what's documented. So, um, so yeah, it really depends. But, but the point is, is that the Queen Mary could go 38 knots. That's a huge deal, because the Queen Mary's uh, previously documented fastest speed was 32.84 knots. So... Going five knots over that is a pretty big deal. It might, might have even been a whole six knots above that. That's crazy. That's incredibly fast. But yeah, the story was that the, the engineer could see the oil levels in the tanks drop. He could visibly see it happening uh, as the ship just chowed through all that fuel. I mean, imagine it. At her cruising speed, the Queen Mary consumed about one gallon of fuel every 12 feet that she went Imagine being at 38 knots. It would be exponentially more. She probably would have been guzzling somewhere around, um, you know, closer to to four or six gallons of fuel per 12 feet. Um, that would have been incredible. 
uh, let's see. As Karthik says, during her trials, has the United States achieved a speed of 43 knots? Oh, okay. Um, well, yeah. Well, anyway, the point is, is that uh, the Queen Mary could have recaptured it if they had no, uh, <laughs> no uh, morals for safety. Um, three days, ten hours, and ten minutes. Okay, so I had it almost right. Robert says Queen Mary has a theoretical hull speed of something like 44 knots, so it's definitely possible, not exactly economical to try and get close to that, though. Yeah, no, definitely not. Um, because if you go, if, if the Queen Mary were to have continuously gone at speeds of 38 knots or more, she would have actually consumed more fuel than she would have been able to, uh, what am I trying to say? She would have consumed so much fuel that she probably wouldn't have made it all the way across the Atlantic. So just because in order to get that extra horsepower, she just consumed so much more fuel, um, yeah, it's incredible. I'm excited to, to, to get this documentation because this would totally change the way we think, but, or at least the way us fans think of ocean liners. I'm sure, I'm sure marine engineers are like, oh yeah, this is, this is no big news. Obviously, if you, you know, if you remove the, the safety features, a ship can go faster. But I mean, this is big news to us regular buffs, history buffs and, and ship buffs because um, because we always think that that these speed trials are basically like the fastest a ship can go is is is, is essentially what we think of it. But but the Queen Mary during World War II, having gone over thirty eight knots, that's a big deal in terms of what we can tell the public. You know, like that's a big deal. I'd love to get my hands on that information. Um, By the way, you can get a Queen Mary ship model at Maritime Replicas. Yeah, I've, I've seen those, but those are like almost $500, and they're not accurate. Um, they, they, what's funny is the, is the Maritime Models Company advertises accurate models, but I was looking at them like, that is not an accurate Queen Mary model. And, those, and that company, Maritime, Maritime Models, they're based in like Vietnam or something. So I don't, I don't know if it's real or if it's a scam like their website looks like it hasn't been updated since 2002 so it's i don't know i wouldn't trust it um mark cooper says yes alex queen mary at 38 knots is a big deal remembering she was designed in the 1920s uh us ssus i think was desired as a military backup in the late 1940s as Karthik says, can Queen Mary dodge the torpedoes and submarines of today? No. The, sub, the submarines today can achieve speeds, I think, just as fast as Queen Mary or more. And then their torpedoes are like twice as fast as they were in World War II. So the Queen Mary today wouldn't really stand a chance against torpedoes. Although if she went 38 knots, she would certainly have a better chance. That's for sure. So, yeah. Yeah, so, but yeah, no. The, today's modern technology is too fast for the Queen Mary. Uh, Skyzilla says, Alex, how did the rogue wave during World War II affect the rest of the voyage after? Well, I don't know. All we can do is assume, because I don't have documentation of what it was like afterwards, but we can assume that if the portholes were smashed and water flooded into the ship, it would have caused some damages, electrical problems, that kind of thing. Uh, we know that some of the of the the men on board were injured because of the violent rolling that happened and everybody being smashed and and you know tumbling into the hallways. There was reports of people on deck being washed away into the sea. Obviously, they never got recovered again because the ship doesn't stop for anything or anyone. So um, we know that the ship had its lifeboats knocked off of their footings. Um, but 
I don't... I, I think only one lifeboat was literally broken off the ship. The rest were just kind of loosened. But I think only one lifeboat was a casualty of that. Um, and then... Uh, yeah, windows were smashed on the bridge. Yeah, we, we can only assume stuff from what we know about the damage that happened during the rogue wave, but I, I don't know of any issues with the propellers. Um, you know, sometimes with rogue waves, it, you could throw a propeller blade or something, um, but I, I haven't heard of any problems with the ship's engineering afterwards. So there really isn't much known besides the result of the rogue wave, as opposed to the voyage back, you know? Yeah, 38 knots is really fast. Um, Skyzilla says, how did the rogue wave that hit Queen Mary during World War II affect the whole voyage afterwards? Wait, isn't that the same question? That's the same question. Anyway, um... Twitch says, no, those are the people that did the Queen Mary 2 model for the Cunard line. I'm going to look that up then. Uh, what was it called again? Maritime Replicas. Let me see. If they're legitimate, then they're probably really expensive. Like, way beyond what I can afford. Uh, let me see. Maritime replicas. Oh, this is a place I haven't heard of. Classic liners. Uh, Queen Mary 2. Here's the original Queen Mary. Oh, wow, that looks really nice. That's Definitely not the same ship I saw. I bet it's going to cost a lot of money, though. Hold on. I'm trying to... I want to see how much it costs. Oh, and they have one for Queen Elizabeth as well. And Lusitania. Oh, man. I would love to buy a good model from here. I mean... I was talking about model kits. I can put together a model kit, because that's usually cheap, but I wouldn't mind buying a whole model, but these are the kinds that, yeah, you know, this is this is the kind of company where you don't just buy it. You have to commission it, and they send you a quote, and honestly, it would probably cost a couple thousand dollars for this Queen Mary model. Um... A cheap company would probably charge 800 900 but if this is a quality company, they're probably going to charge closer to 2000 or 3000 for this model. I don't have that kind of money. So um, I'd rather find a, a good quality kit, although there are none that exist. Uh, there's only old quality kits. So there's like some kits that... Uh, Yeah. Yeah. That's unfortunate. Uh, all right. Let's see what the what the chat says. Uh, Tyler says, "Do you think it was chaos in the engine room during the rogue wave?" Yeah, I would. Oh, I mean. Not chaos in the sense that they're like, oh, let's, you know, we got to adjust this and adjust. No, I don't think it was like that. Um, I think it was more like, what the heck just happened? You know, Bob here smashed his head on the turbine, you know, like that kind of thing, that kind of chaos. 
Um, I'm sure somebody got injured. Um, but I don't think it was much chaos. Robert says, does Ravel still make the 1570 kit? They don't make it anymore, but you can still look for people who are selling it. Um, I would I would buy it if it was a decent price, but the reason why I say decent is because it's a terrible quality model. I've I've look I've seen it myself. It is highly inaccurate. It barely even looks like the Queen Mary. Um, there are three different models that were built of the Queen Mary kits. One in the 1960s, one in the 1970s, and one in 1986. All three, by today's standards, are terrible quality models. But if I got the 1986 one, which I think is the Ravel model, I could do some what they call kit bashing, which is where you you um, kind of adjust it yourself to make it look more realistic. So if I had the 1986 model from Ravel, I think I could kind of work on it and make it look more realistic. Um, but I certainly can't do it with the 1972 model or the 1964 model. They're, those ones are too far, like, those ones are, are, are too poorly made for me to be able to make them look good. But, um, but yeah. But you see, the thing is, if I'm able to get the 570 Queen Mary, I'm going to have to buy a brand new 570 Titanic model because... I have a 1 350th scale Titanic model, but I want Queen Mary and Titanic to be the same scale so I can show people the different sizes, especially when I have, like, friends or family come over. You know, the, they always like to see the models I have and stuff, and I want to be able to say, like, look, this is the Queen Mary and this is the different size it is, you know. So if I find it, I'd love to do that. Carl says, sorry, Alex, I had to leave. I'm back. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it, it in Halifax, the training with the bridge sticking out their side to deploy heavy machinery. What? Oof. I know. Sorry. <laughs> that was, I did not understand that. But I'm glad you're back. Um, as Karthik says, why do countries not make battleships anymore? They were so cool. Um... I, you know, I don't want to say too much because I don't know much about battleships, but I'm pretty sure the the United States still makes some kind of battleships, don't they? Pretty sure they do, because we need them. Um, but, uh... Tyler says the SS Poseidon model is the most accurate model of the ship today. It has the catwalk on the forward well deck. Uh, and the staircase that connects the promenade deck. I never even thought about looking for a Poseidon model. Let me see. I didn't even think about that. Like, I'm sure I'm sure someone makes Poseidon models. Um, Google. Try a model kit. Oh, there are no kits for SS Poseidon. Okay, well, that was unfortunate. Uh, Mysterious Wanderer says the U.S. only has destroyers. Hmm. Matthew Mahoney says, did Queen Mary ever lose a propeller blade? No, she didn't. Part of the reason why is because, unlike Titanic, Queen Mary's propeller blades were permanently attached to the propeller... Um, I forget what it's called, the cone itself. So it was cast as a single piece, essentially. And, uh, but on Titanic, it was the, the center of the propeller had the blades bolted onto it. Um, and so it was common for ships of Titanic's time to actually throw propeller blades uh, during rough weather or collisions. 
Uh, but Queen Mary, to my knowledge, never did. Chris with the case is they stopped making battleships because of air superiority. They got outclassed in World War II by carriers, and by that time, the only thing they needed battleships for was lane bom bombardment. Interesting. Tyler says, looked up one used in the movie, it's in San Pedro. Yeah, but I, I thought you were talking about model kits that I could build. So that's why I was looking it up, but I realized that you meant, like, models that have already been built that are in places. But I, I'm looking for... My goal here is to is to find a good quality model kit of the original RMS Queen Mary that I can build. I don't want to buy one from a company that already makes models because those are usually hundreds to thousands of dollars. So it has to be a model kit. And um, yeah. And I tried looking up people who maybe created 3D models that they can print. And there is one person who created a 3D model of the Queen Mary that you can print out. But it is not accurate at all. It doesn't look anything like the Queen Mary. It is so highly inaccurate. And I was just like, ugh, I can't buy that either. So, Or print that out either because it was just so bad. It was so, so inaccurate. The dimensions and everything were completely off. So I wish I could find something. Uh, Skyzilla says, Alex, are propeller blades on N on the Alex, are, pro are propeller blades on any ship able to stop or slice a torpedo? I don't know. I I don't know. Carl says the Queen Mary had floating bridge to rule off heavy machinery during war. Saw a pic that the test was in Canada. Are you sure you're not thinking of like there there was like a there was a a military ship that was named Queen Mary. Uh so you might be thinking of that. Uh but I'm talking about the ocean liner, the RMS Queen Mary. There was like an HMS or something Queen Mary, but that's not the ship I'm talking about. I don't know anything about warships. Um but yeah, so um, this live stream has gone on long enough. It's been well over two hours, um, but it has been really awesome talking to you guys. Um, more videos are coming out uh, on the channel soon, uh, so keep checking back and stuff like that. The next Tea Time live stream will be... What is today? Okay, so the next Tea Time live stream will be on Tuesday at 4 p.m. Pacific time. Um, and let me think if there's anything else I need to tell you guys. Uh, I don't think so, but if you'd like to support the channel, you can look at the links below in the description for um, my Patreon, my YouTube membership, my Venmo, my Squarespace thing, or not Squarespace, but Square, where you can donate money to me. Um, and then I'm thinking about starting up some kind of, uh, Kickstarter for my, um, my trip to the UK and to Paris to film stuff for the channel, um, which would be awesome. So, um, anyway, you can donate to any one of those things if you'd like to support the channel. Otherwise, um, just stay tuned for more videos and thank you all so much for joining me for this Tea Time live stream. I always enjoy these things. And I'll see you all next time. Bye-bye.